Welcome to the Raising Cinephiles podcast, a show about passing on your love of cinema to the next generation. I'm your host, Jessica Cantor, and I have worked in all facets of the entertainment industry for the last 20 years and recently became a mom. This week, our guest is Elisa Donovan. She's an actress, author, and playwright. Her memoir, Wake Me Up When You Leave, was adapted into a one-woman play and now into a screenplay, which she intends to direct. We had a wonderful conversation about the inspiration for her work, getting the opportunity to play Amber on the set of Clueless, and discovering her daughter's taste. It's a little different than her peers, not enjoying films like Frozen, but rather wanting to see films with a different kind of depth. Always remember that myself and guests are speaking from personal experience, not giving parenting advice. Let's go ahead and dive into the episode. Welcome to the Raising Sin of Files podcast. This is Jessica Cantor, your host, and I am here with Elisa Donovan. She's an actress, a director, a writer. She has her memoir out which is called Wake Me Up When You Leave, which she's adapting. She starred in one of my all-time favorite movies, Clueless. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned it multiple times on this podcast, so I'm really excited to welcome you here today. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. So I dive right into my first question, which is what is your first movie memory? So I, I knew you were going to ask me this, and... I at first thought that it was Grease being in the movie theater, Mm -hmm. which I absolutely have a very distinct memory of that experience. And then also in the moments in the film that I didn't understand, because I think that came out somewhere maybe 78 or something around there. So I was born in 1971, so I was probably like seven, eight, something like that. And I remember those moments of, wait, what is the, when she's talking and when Rizzo is talking about her periods late. And I was like, what is going on? Like, what are these things? Who, what is she talking about? And my mom's just kind of glossing over it. And then absolutely wanting to be Olivia Newton-John in her tight leather pants and smoking a cigarette. Like it's so, (laughs) I, it's such a distinct memory of feeling like I just was, taken away to this world that because it's obviously a period piece so I also was going wait is this what happens when you go to high school like everything <laughs> looks like this yeah, but then I, I also remember this Disney film Escape from Witch Mountain so maybe I saw that on TV but that also was a major imprint on me because these two kids had these psychic powers And I thought it was amazing. I just could not get, and I feel like there might have been books of those as well, maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Escape to Witch Mountain. Will you tell me more about it? Yeah, it was the kind of thing where they did these sequels of Escape. The first one was either from or to, and then the second one was to or from Escape to Witch Mountain or from Witch Mountain. They were two. I think they were orphaned children, brother and sister. Kim Richards was the girl. And I think, I don't know how they, someone kidnapped them because they discovered that they had these psychic powers, that they could read people's minds and they could see the future. But their bond as brother and sister was really tight. And it was a Disney thing. The parents died somehow. (laughs) You never talk about them. (laughs) And then this horrible man wants to kidnap them to financially benefit from their gifts. And then someone feel like the there was like a widower and it was, it was somebody like Eddie Fisher or some like very well-known actors, older men at the time. And he is really cranky and and unhappy. And then he winds up saving the kids. And I think he winds up adopting them or taking them on from, and then the next one is another one. I I feel like their powers started to accelerate as the sequels went on. I don't quite remember (laughs) where then it just became absurd. Like they could, uh, had flying saucers on their head. I don't know what, but something. But that first one was so, I was so engaged in it and felt like I want to be these people. I want to be in this story and just being transported to another place through story. Yeah. And what was it, what was your family viewing 
situation. My mom loves movies. I mean, she still does. She is the kind of person that will go to see a movie five times in a theater if she likes it. And uh, I, I at one point tried to get her, I mean, she's 84. And she maybe 20 years ago, I said, you should have a movie review blog because mm-hmm. she would call me up and say, did you see that? Oh, that Spanish man, the movie with the wig and the guns. And I'm like, no country for old men. And she's like, yes, this was so great. But it was really about his wig. And I'm like, actually, it was not about his wig. Mom. <laughs> and she, uh, but she would, I grew up on Long Island in, in New York. And mm-hmm. so the winters are obviously very cold. And I remember in the extreme bits of weather, the extremely hot summer and the, the extreme cold, if we were just home, we would watch movies on the weekends. And it was Alfred Hitchcock movies are the ones that I really remember as a child, not completely being able to follow them, but really being excited when I could, when mm-hmm. I understood what was going on or I started to solve what was happening. And we would make popcorn and watch those movies. And then seeing, I mean, all the big ones, Gremlins and Jaws and P and I remember Poltergeist or Close Encounters, I think, was the the one where I felt like, wait a second, I don't understand what's happening. <laughs> Is this, <laughs> they're aliens? Like what? Because I wasn't really into sci-fi. I wasn't mm-hmm. like a Star Wars kid. Mm-hmm. That wasn't, those were not the type of films that I was into. But so I remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind being a little bit outside of the box for me, but then being oddly emotionally moved by it, like Mm -hmm. understanding there was something very deep happening to these people. And Richard Dreyfuss is so amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So he, but I remember that feeling of not quite cognitively understanding what's happening, but understanding that these grownups are having something very important happen to them that is affecting their, their heart and their, their spirit. Yeah. And do do you have siblings? I do have an older brother and older sister. Did that affect what you got to watch? Probably because I'm thinking about this and going, I was really, if I saw Jaws, I mean, I think that came out in 1975 and I'm, I'm fairly certain I must have seen it in the theater, I would think. So that would mean I was quite young to see that movie. (laughs) Do you go in the ocean? That's the question. (laughs) I know. I'm shocked that I just, and I just watched it recently with my daughter who's Mm -hmm. 11 and she can really handle scary things. She kind of likes them and she, and she's a surfer and Uh she is afraid of the water. And I was a little worried that she was going to have, it's, this is going to instill some fear in her. Zero. Not at all. She thought the movie was scary. Mm-hmm. But then she said, when that shark started jumping up on the boat, I mean, I really knew that he, that was never going to happen in real life. And I said, that is right. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I have a, a friend who she was on the podcast, like the first set of episodes that came out, Lily. She's an eight year old and he's been begging her to see Jaws. And she's like, no, oh. no. Maybe after Hawaii this summer. <laughs> first, get some enjoyment. And then if you have to be relieved of that for a couple of years. <laughs> But he, I don't think he's great with scaries. Yeah, it definitely seems that some kids are. Like my daughter, for example, was never Frozen was the big movie when she was in preschool. Every child was singing those songs and she was not into it. She was not interested. Like she does not, she has always gravitated towards more complex things. She's a very old soul, Mm -hmm. needless to say, but it doesn't interest her. Like it doesn't stimulate her. She Mm -hmm. finds it very silly. Like Mm -hmm. she doesn't want to watch it. So it's always been more just, just different sorts of things than, than typical kid movies. Yeah. That's interesting. Before we dive into her, I have a few more questions. Yes. The first is, was there a moment in watching cinema that you realized you wanted to work in it? Oh, yeah. Well, so I did a did theater. I did a play in the first grade. Mm-hmm. And 
I was just obsessed with it. Like I, it was this play called Westward Ho, Ho, Ho. And I played a bad guy. The character's name was Ralph Rotten. Mm -hmm. And so I had like a big 10 gallon hat and I got a fake mustache. And I remember my mom just being exhausted by how invested in this thing I was. Like I said, I need a, 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 a button up, a black one that I can, and then wear a tie. And she's like, you're seven years old. There are no black button down shirts. Like, like they don't doesn't exist for girls in the seventies. And so we dyed it, we used this dye and it only came out gray instead of black. And I was devastated. And my mom was just like, what is going on? And I was so invested in this character and so excited on stage, but I didn't understand that it could be a job. Was nobody in my family was in any sort of creative field. And so I would just thought this was like the greatest, most fun thing ever. And then I kept wanting to do it. So I started taking classes and, and things like that. But I didn't even understand that it was a job. So even watching movies, I didn't understand that those were people like me, like mm-hmm. at one point that they were just like me. And something clicked in eighth grade is when I really started to pursue acting in a in a real way much to the disappointment of my father who was like oh boy this is not really the way I want you to go but I think in terms of film probably trying to think of when I knew there so junior high into high school is really when I went this is absolutely what I want to do with my life. Like I know this is what I want to do. I want to be in film. I mean, I I still wanted to be doing theater. And then I started to understand that you could do commercials and you could. So I got an agent and started auditioning and my mom had to take me into the city. But when I read, but films seemed like, oh gosh, God, do I want to do that? Really want to be a part of that. But it felt like just so far away so far out of reach for me I didn't even understand how how I could get there and so I think probably even in watching Greece and things like that and those movies are E.T. I think E.T. is really when I went I can do this because I think because there were so many younger kids in that and Drew Barrymore, obviously, who was so <laughs> amazing. But just the fact that there were kids kind of close-ish to my age, it made me understand maybe I can do this. Yeah. yeah. You're you're lucky your mom took you into the city to auditions. It's yeah. like the perfect kind of parent is a be- begrudgingly helpful parent, yes. right? <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah. Like you can't, you have to do all of your school schoolwork. You have to, but I always was a kid who I dove a hundred percent into whatever I was doing. Like I was a competitive gymnast until I was like 10. So and was I, I actually. You were? I was, and I outgrew it because I'm really tall. Me too. <laughs> Me too. And I'm not even that tall. And oh I remember God. feeling at nine, 10, like, oh. I, I actually started fracturing my growth plates. And so my parents took me oh, out wow. and I went to ballet and that summer. Which I was so much better for your so body. So much better for my body, right? Your body. <laughs> and I grew a foot that summer. And you know how your social dynamics when you're in middle school is about your height. I lost all my friends that were like, I, I like offended them that I grew. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was the same way with like dance. My mom was like, look, like you can do it, but it's you. And it's like way less expensive for me if you quit. So. <laughs> right. 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 I mean, and then we, then I got into competitive horseback riding, which is like also one of these things where my dad kept saying, Does, she doesn't understand these things are supposed to be hobbies. They are not <laughs> supposed to be <laughs> taking over our lives. But my brother was a competitor. He, he rode horses as well. And my sister did for a little bit, but my brother was really serious. So then when I got, when I started to really get into acting, then I just dropped all those other Mm. things. And I was a hundred percent on board with acting and writing really, because I was a, I was a writer in high school too. That's great. Yeah. There was a moment I remember 
it was probably way too late. I think in my late twenties, or early thirties, mm -hmm. and I had gone from being a dancer to going to college and then wanting to work as a film producer. And then like, I, I, like I kept wrapping my identity up in my career. And yes. I remember my mom saying like, you can just do something for fun. You don't have to embody the entire thing. And yeah. so my question for you is, was there a moment when you were able to separate your identity from your work? Nope. No. <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I always say this if I, I talk to young people about acting or, or, or anything. You... <sighs> Like I, I studied, my major was dramatic literature, mm -hmm. right? And I was an English major, dramatic literature and, and acting. So comedy was like not, that was not a thing for me. But my family is very funny. We are just like naturally funny people, I think. And so I just approached everything like a drama. And then I get cast in this film that becomes this huge success that that's what you become known for. And then you're going, you're constantly trying to break out of that, like at once being very, very grateful because that's like striking gold. It's a, it's very difficult to do and you're just so grateful, but then also going, but I have all these other pursuits that I want to do. I was writing one woman shows while on our hiatus from the, doing the TV show and doing like, I was doing all this other creative stuff that mm -hmm. at the time wasn't really, I mean, this was in the mid nineties. Nobody really wanted to hear from women no. at all. You know? it's, and so it's still on the fence. That's whether anybody wants to hear us talk. But so I was constantly met with this. Oh, that's great. You have ideas. Great. So here's another TV show where you can be the mean, pretty girl. Mm -hmm. And then everybody was like, oh, you're funny, but you're like not ugly. So this is just amazing. It was like this weird, short-sighted thing of you were either like the 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 pretty f mean friend or you were the overweight, disliked friend. Like there were all these very specific and stereotypical places that you could fall. Mm -hmm. And none of that also included being an actress who actually was a writer or an actress who could direct. And I spent all my 20s essentially just thinking like a director on sets, like that's what I was doing. Like, why are they shooting it this way? And how they, why can't we go from this angle? Like I was always seeing the full picture. Mm -hmm. And I know not all actors do that. Some actors don't want to know any of that. They just mm -hmm. don't, it's not their thing. But for me, it always was yeah. the full picture, the full thing. Did you then look at the finished product and see if the vision you saw on set matched oh, yeah. what happened? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, boy. So, yes, yes. And that was a big lesson in, in a lot of, of things. But, yeah, yes. And I still have a hard time watching. I, I try, I'm trying to see, like, what the timeline is of, like, how many years need to go by before I can see something and say, oh, that was pretty good. Not miss the pieces. Like, I see everything that they cut or why did they – edit it that way and how powerful that's how I started to understand how powerful editing is mm -hmm. and that television is really completely an editor's me I mean they just like yeah. hack it. and so all I, I I absolutely have watched many things it's just it's difficult especially doing like serious television when there's so much. And when you have to do ADR, you're you're doing it a couple of times a week anyway for the episode before. And so you're always seeing everything all the time. And then that starts to inform I would how my performance, or I would say, oh, this is how they're doing that. So I need to. So it's like directing yourself. Yeah. That's a lot. My second job, my second like real job was a showrunner's assistant. And I actually had my boss on the podcast, Raven Metzner, who is a writer and, and kind of is going to get me into this next couple of questions I'm going to ask you. But 
I there was like a joke by episode four of of broadcast television. The showrunners have a nervous breakdown because you have so many episodes in the pipeline and in yes. in the can and then edit and holding all that story and all of that in mind. And it was such a, an amazing experience to have a front row seat to all of that and sit in the edits and and then see the perspective of the producers of an actor on set and then the perspective of the studio and the editors of watching their performance and how everyone did, did not like a certain actress who turned into a superstar. So I will not say her name, but showed up very late, always needed hours in makeup and whatnot. But then we'd watch her in the edit and she just gave so much. She was going to work forever. It didn't matter her behavior because she just it was amazing. So one of the things I talked to Raven about, which I think might be an interesting topic for us to before we move into your to your daughter, which I'm so excited. I have a lot of questions after you gave me a little mm-hmm. sneak preview. Pros into screenplay. You're in the process of adapting your novel. I just wrote my first novel, first draft of my first novel. So very early in the in the process. And the the freedom of prose. And uh, then like moving love, that into wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Well, talk to me about that experience. So well, interestingly, this the the book originally I did it as a one woman show at the Geffen Theater in LA at the Audrey Skirball as a benefit. But I had first started writing it when all of these things happened. My my dad got cancer and died. My relationship ended. And Sabrina, the TV show I was doing, was canceled. And all these things happened in very close succession. So essentially, my whole life just turned upside down. And I thought I knew everything about where I was going and what I was doing. And then I knew nothing. Mm-hmm. So in writing it, during that time, it always started as prose. And then, of course people were saying to me, well, you're an actress, you should write it, write a play or write a movie. And I was like, I don't want to write a play or a movie. I want to write a book. And ultimately I had to listen to these people. So I did this hybrid and wrote it as this one woman show, but it was like, I had to take away the prose. I did, did a couple of readings for screenwriter friends and other authors that I knew. And they always, I remember my friend Peter saying to me, reading a couple of lines back to me and saying, this is beautiful. And I was like, thank you. Like, I love this line too. And he's like, and you have to cut it because no one says that. Like you can't, that's for the book. And I went, oh, it was like frustrating. But that process was so useful to me, not only in getting to the real the real truth and the authenticity of the piece itself and what I was trying to say, but how to communicate it in that medium. When Mm -hmm. I'm here speaking in the first person to an audience, it's very different than even now having done the book and doing readings. Reading from your book is also a very different experience. Than So I loved the process of going back to the prose. Mm-hmm. I just loved it because I love language. I love, I just love telling stories through, through, through the kind of sensations that we have internally, emotionally and mentally, and, and even physically. I love the specificity that you can have with that and mm-hmm. like the real depth you can achieve. And especially with this book being about grief and loss and the afterlife and this kind of spiritual experience, all those things are very hard to articulate in a in a kind of simple way. So it really lends itself to being able to use a little bit more of artful language and be able to to express with more words. And then of course, putting it into the screenplay <laughs> This was like a whole other experience of going, it's it, it's different than the play as well. And the first draft of the screenplay, Nell Scavell, who is a, a great writer and journalist and TV producer, writer, she, she had seen the play at the Geffen and was like, this is so beautiful. It was a really special experience. And I, that was the moment when I went, this is what I want to do with my life mm-hmm. going forward. Like whatever, it doesn't have to be a play every time, but I need to do work that touches people in this way. Mm -hmm. So 
if I'm going to make it as a film or I'm going to make a TV show or I'm going to write a book, like whatever it is, this is the way, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So Mm -hmm. I I felt very clear to me. And Nell was the first person to read the first draft of the screenplay. (laughs) And she like didn't get back to me for like a month. And she's a person who's very like, we're close. She went super fast. And then I had to kind of poke her again. And I said, so have you had a chance? And she said, Elisa, I just, I have to be honest with you. She said, it's, it's terrible. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> no. And she said, you just took the play and you put it into the final draft. That's what you did. You didn't make it a movie. And she said, my, my mom is a very big character in both the book and in the, the film. And she said, she was such a wonderful, vibrant, heartbreaking, but hilarious character. And she said, it doesn't come across. So that's when I went, okay, now I have to really get serious about making this an entirely different piece. And those sorts of things are what really help. As a writer, we need the outside influence, especially if it's something personal, because sometimes we just can't get out of our own way. And if she hadn't told me those things, I mean, first of all, the film would not be in development now. Cause if I had just sent that to everyone, everybody would be like, what is this? You're like, she's a good friend. Good friends exactly. tell you the hard things. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting. Raven started his career as a novelist and I asked him what that experience was going from an insular kind of interior writing to yeah. something visual. And he said, well, writing a script is really about, a, it's, it's a blueprint for a movie or a TV show. It's not the inner life. And so all of your experience being on set and directing and having that visual visual language is now how you have to re- reinterpret and reimagine, right? Yes. And how this, this economy of language in screenwriting where it's, yes, it does have to be as slight as possible, but it has to be that much more powerful and accurate in what you're Mm -hmm. saying. And so the descriptions, which I always, I look and make sure, is this, is there a paragraph of description? This is not a screenplay. This Mm -hmm. is, this is like leaning, going back towards. So it's this sort of constant exercise of really saying and trusting that it's, it's the, the actors and the cinematography and the direction that is going to make this whole piece. It isn't, it's this funny thing of, they say, especially with small films, like it has to be on the page. You don't have the luxury of seeing what will work and what won't. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it it's, it's the actors bring so much to it. Like the, the, the spirit of, of every character is going to come from, from the actor mm-hmm. and then how we put it together. It's such a collaborative process, which is one of the things that I love. I mean, I remember being so struck by that when we shot Clueless of how, I mean, that was amazing for the first film I had ever done to be. I had done some TV before. I did this TV show, Blossom, mm-hmm. Joey Blossom. Lawrence and Maya, yeah. and uh, <laughs> it was great. That's a sitcom. It's a multicam, totally different situation. But being on the set of that film, I was just in awe at how every department was spectacular at their job. Wardrobe was stunning and so specific. Set deck was incredible. Anytime you walked on set, there were these very specific, elaborate things that it just everyone, Bill Pope, like one of the greatest DPs ever. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't understand how lucky I was. I just thought, oh, this is what making movies is like. This is always what it'll be like. (laughs) And Amy, how brilliant, like her words are so specific and so wise and hilarious. And it's a great collaboration at its best. It's like everyone having enough resources and, and time to actually excel at their at their, craft. At their art. Yeah. yeah. Are you watching any specific films to crib ideas from as you prep? So, yeah, I have been 
And when I mentioned this, there are a couple of films when I mentioned them to my producer, he's like, so don't, don't mention those films when you, when we're, when we're trying to raise the money for the movie. He's like, cause those films did not do well. I'm like, yeah, but they're amazing films. He's like, right. But let's not, that'll just be between you and I. <laughs> they're the, the films you talk to your department heads about, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> like what dreams may come. Do you mm-hmm. remember this movie with Robin Williams and Annabella? Shiora where she passes away Mm -hmm. and he is like absolutely devastated and he goes into this world of art and so there's a certain amount of magical realism that will be a part of it because there are dreams in this movie where the father comes to the daughter in dreams but also it's it's a it's a dramedy I mean it's it's a it's a family story it's a very it's a cancer story and a Mm -hmm. and a story of a girl at a quarter life crisis where mm. she everything falls to pieces so and I just also started watching the series Enlightened with Laura Dern mm-hmm. do you remember this yes. like in 2011 only because well because she's amazing and I would watch her do anything but because it's about this person who is trying to fix their life and thinks that they are doing the right thing all the time because they've had this spiritual experience, but she's still completely self-centered and still can't like quite get past. And tonally, there are similarities there mm-hmm. where it's it's a dramedy for sure. And, uh, and then there are other what has elements of like the 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 family holiday movies like the Holly Hunter Home for the Holidays. Mm-hmm where the family dynamics are very much at play. And uh, yeah, so I'm yeah. watching all sorts of things. Have, for some reason, I keep thinking of Little Miss Sunshine. Yes. Is so that, that the right tone? That, that is totally the right tone. Yes. Yeah. That one yes. was successful. Yes. So you can use that as a call. Right. Right. He's like, you can talk about that one all you want. Right. <laughs> Little Miss Sunshine is yeah. exactly the the feeling. Yes. Yeah. With some, a little bit of magic in there too. Yeah. Beautiful. So I'm going to start moving us towards your your daughter. Did the projects you wanted to make and the stories you wanted to tell change when you had your child? A hundred percent. One hundred percent. I think when I was, as I mentioned before, doing things like Clueless and Roxbury and Sabrina and all these big comedy, I was constantly thirsting to play like the heroin addict who lost her five kids in a fire. Like I just always wanted to do something darker and deeper. And then I realized, this is even kind of before I had my daughter, I realized I I don't actually want to put those things in into the world. I don't, I think it's fine. Like there's room for everything, but I personally feel as though I don't need to do that. Like, that's not what my thing. And then when I had my daughter, I went, oh my gosh, I really think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that line of not making everything a shiny, happy ending, but really authentically telling stories that, that, that respect, have a respect for human life Mm -hmm. and have a, a, a respect for morals and moral value and mm. and challenge like doing I mean I'm making a film about cancer and death and losing your job these are not easy things but I think we can tell these stories with a reverence and a and a heart that allows mm. us to celebrate the human experience as opposed to just death and dying for death's sake it's like I have such a strong feeling about violence in movies because I just, especially sexual violence, I just, I, it's, it's like I could, I get really upset by that. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you can't, there's such a responsibility to putting those images into the world. Mm-hmm. And it's just done so irresponsibly so often that it, it, like, it really bothers me. And I don't, I feel like it's such, it's like the ship has already sailed. We are just on a journey where you're going, what is happening right now? Like, why, why is any of this okay? (laughs) And I don't mean to sound like everything. I just feel like I I wish there was a, a way to put that 
genie back in the bottle a little bit. Yeah. Definitely think about it with my daughter because I'm probably more conservative about what she watches than a lot of people that I know. How do you make those choices? Do you, do you watch movies before you show them to her? Do you have resources? Yes, I definitely watch them first. And some of the, and then also there are websites like Common Sense Media mm-hmm. is a good one, but they also sometimes, I don't quite agree, but it's at least information. And then you can remember, and so many of these, I mean, like so many people, I think in the pandemic, we <laughs> started watching more TV and films than I ever intended my child to be watching regularly. All these movies, these beloved kid movies like Goonies and this like I don't Goonies doesn't hold up <laughs> like it doesn't. I, yeah I've heard that a few times I love it guy in the basement who's chained up and is <sighs> deformed and they call him horrible names and the girl is like the Carrie Green is like she's just objectified like there's no tomorrow and they're just like there's so many mm-hmm. things in it that are upsetting <laughs> so it's it's like a I, in watching them again, you go, oh, okay. But like E.T. is okay. (laughs) And we just watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, which that's another one that I remember seeing and just going like, I cannot get enough of this film. I loved it so much as a kid. And I just watched it with my daughter and and two friends of hers, another family. We were on the East Coast and, and it's great. And it reminded me of how, yes, there are some scary things in it and some violent things, but it's not excessive extended violence. It's Mm -hmm. like adventure and then something gory will happen and and then the snakes and the various things. But it's like those things, they're built up and they happen and they're scary and then you move on. Instead of these like 15 minute, you know, violent scenes that just seem to keep getting longer and longer in films these days. And I don't know what the algorithm is. I'm, I'm certain there is one and that's why they're doing that. Like there must be some reason, but even my daughter will say she likes, she likes like some Marvel movies. And I went, I've got a hard no on those movies. And then I said, okay, I have to watch some of these movies to see like what's okay and uh, she so she likes ant-man for example and i feel like that is a very it's a, it's an easier one of them all to watch but even she will say this is like going on for a long time the the kind of action sequences of like and there she gets bored mm-hmm. and or spider-man like i love the tom holland Spider-Man's and I've only watched them because my daughter's interested in it. So then I watch it and then I say, okay, this is, this is okay. And it has a good message and, but it's, it's, it's a tough call. You had mentioned that you knew from a young age that she liked films and television with a little bit more depth and she wasn't into Frozen. So what are some of the things that you showed her when she was? So she, we, the, one of the first times that we went to LA or that she remembers because we, we live in San Francisco, but I would go down for work all the time. And one of the first times that she remembers we drove because I was going to be there for a few weeks. And as we were leaving, we were getting onto the 101 and there was a huge sign billboard for Harry Potter world mm-hmm. at Universal. And she just went, what is that? And then I said, oh, it's Harry Potter. And that preceded, that turned into a probably like two and a half hour conversation of questions of what is Harry Potter? When can I see these things? Like, what are we doing? And I said, they're actually books that I love. They're wonderful books. And so I said, we'll read the books first and then you can watch the movie. So that was the the rule of we read the first one and then she could watch the movie and then read the second book and then she could watch the movie. And, and at first, it was a little, she was a little young. I think we started, re- I was reading them to her when she was like five and a half or so probably. And then watched the first movie maybe at six or six and a half. And then those those books get darker and darker mm-hmm. as they go. So we started to take it a little bit slower in the reading so that we wouldn't get there too quickly. But those, I think those films made her love love the books, but really love movies. Mm -hmm. And she, that was really the start of her being 
really excited and engaged and engrossed in the story in who these people are and and how do they get there and she feels very like she's a really sensitive kid she's like an intuitive kid and so she she thinks about oh this is sad for harry like the how could they leave him under the stairs he had to live under the stairs like all these and it's so sad that he doesn't know his parents like that would be really terrible but she, like, we talk about all these things, mm-hmm. so she then can metabolize it. Because they don't, kids don't, from what I've learned anyway, they don't, while it's happening, they're not necessarily getting it. And then later, they they bring it all together and then have questions or are upset or so. And then the older that they get, the more capable, she's more capable of articulating it while she's seeing something mm-hmm. or watching. But she really is just into all of that and now she's not as into harry potter but i would say that was a good start and then she also there was this australian tv show that she we like happened upon it i don't even know how it it started but it's called the investigators oh and it's these little kids who are they start in it like a detective agency and they're in fourth grade and it is so smart and so good spirited. And she, in the pandemic, we just like, there are only two seasons, I think. And I, I wish there were more because it was, I felt completely safe with her watching this show. And the kids were really smart and funny. And there's always a lesson in everything and they're doing. So she was into, she's very into that too. Oh, that's great. And how did you know she was okay with horror? Or like scarier stuff. So I think because of Harry Potter and she, and like some kids at that age did not want to see that. Like they were really scared. There are creatures in the second one, there's the big snake and she just, she was okay with, and when we were reading the books, she, I would check in with her and say, is this okay? And she's like, yes, yes. Like, let's keep reading it. But some kids, for example, just can't, they don't want to see. And yeah. friends of hers would be like, we, we can't watch the, this movie because it's not enjoyable for them. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if also because you read the book and she had a version in her imagination that she was so. able to be in the imaginative world and not the reality of what she's yes. watching. And then she could be thinking, oh, I saw this in a different way. And oh, that's what that person looks like. Or that's what, and a kind of understanding that the book can be one thing and the, the, the film is, it turns into something else. And do you think also, cause having you and understanding that movies are a craft, does she understand that? So I, I try to, to explain that to her without ruining her viewing experience. <laughs> But she, I'm trying to think of what, because she didn't really even understand what I did for a long time until like kids in her preschool, her friend Vivian, who's still a very good friend of hers now, like she had been on an airplane. And I also did this series of movies, family movies with talking dogs. Mm -hmm. And so Vivian had seen one of these movies on the airplane and like came in and said, Scarlett's mom is a movie star. To the whole class. And Scarlett just said, oh, no, she's not. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so, but now she thinks it's cool because, well, first of all, the funny thing is she knows that the film is in development and she knows some of the actors that are attached. She knows them because she's met them before. And, but then she just feels like, well, didn't you make that movie yet? Like, what, what's going on in this movie? Like, why is it taking so long? It takes a long time to get the financing together and to have. And she, there's one, I'm confident that we are, that we'll have the financing soon and that we will shoot it by the end of the year. But there's one shot that is, it's, is a very pivotal part of the story where the character is understanding that her dreams are affecting her her waking life. And it involves a a little girl walking down a hallway in the hospital and she's holding a diorama, like one of those things that Mm -hmm. they make in school out of a shoebox. And so I said, I want Scarlett to do that, to be the kid holding the, the, the box, because that would just be, and the child's supposed to be six or seven, 
my daughter's 11 now, but she's tiny. So I'm like, if she doesn't go through a growth spurt, <laughs> she could maybe still <laughs> be able to have her on her knees. But then she's like, so all my friends, they'll, they'll come to the premiere of the movie. Right. And I'm like, wait, what, like, what are you talking about? She's already got a whole plan of, I said, no, this is not a kid's film. No. And she said, well, are they not going to be allowed to watch it? And I said, well, yes, eventually, but like in her mind, she's at the Oscars with this movie, with her cameo in the. <laughs> That's really cute. <laughs> have you have you shown her Clueless or any of the? Work no, I that still you've done? feel like Clueless is a little bit too. She there are a couple of kids in her class who have seen it, which makes her feel like she should be allowed to. And I just I just feel like she's still too young. Maybe yeah. and when she's like. 12 or 13 maybe but I think she I was has, 13 or 14 yeah. when I saw it and yeah. I saw it in theaters and it just hit me perfect it was like the perfect yes. age for that movie I think so I think there are things that she still wouldn't get but then she's savvy enough to know there's something to get and I would rather that it just is more appropriate. So I feel like if I can wait till 13, I will. But she's seen some of, I did one of the dog movies pregnant with her where I'm very visibly, I mean, I was like seven and a half months pregnant and she wanted to see, I feel like this was another pandemic thing of like, okay, sure. That's let's watch this. And then you're like, oh, sitting on the couch and she's staring, trying to understand, wait a minute. I'm in your belly and then you're talking, but that's not dad. Like you're that you're with another man in this movie. Like, I think it was a little much for her because mm -hmm. she was in first grade at the, at the time. But so she's seen a couple of those things, but she hasn't seen Clueless or not even Sabrina. I mean, cause I, I don't know. Yeah. She just hasn't. And we're coming to the close of our time. So I'll, I'll ask you my last question which is if there was one movie that I should definitely make sure Miles sees so that he loves cinema, what should that movie be? Right. I would say, oh my gosh, these are the ones that are my favorites, but it's going to be a while for him <laughs> or he can see these movies. Anything, I would say three movies. The Shawshank Redemption mm -hmm. is one of my favorite movies of all time and really made me feel like, those are the kinds of films that I want to be a part of. Like those are the stories that I want to tell. Oh my God. I love all of Alma Dover's movies. Like we didn't even talk about that. I lived it like that. I'm a huge fan of his, but I would say, okay, Shawshank Redemption, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing. It was another really pivotal movie for me that came out in high school. And I felt like, I mean, I wrote a letter to Spike Lee when I was like 17 and said, I need to be in your next movie. I will be the only having, I mean, a friend of mine's like, you should write a book of like all of your letters. Like I wrote a letter to Ang Lee after I saw Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Like at the, I'm just like, oh my God. I, yeah. I wrote he a, did not write back. Spike oh, did not write back. <laughs> I wrote a letter in college to Cameron Crowe because I loved yes. Almost Famous so much. Yes. And they invited me to intern. Are you kidding? And I've never written to Cameron Crowe instead <laughs> <laughs> and because I wanted to make I, I didn't want to be in them I wanted to make movies I wanted to write and so I was like I want to learn from you I want to whatever and it was just like a fan letter I didn't even ask for anything I was at NYU at the time and I I couldn't do it because I couldn't afford to go to LA for a free internship and live and so I didn't do it I interned at Miramax or some, something terrible and <laughs> really different different experience very different experience <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I also wrote almost all of my jobs. Everything came from heartfelt letters. Yes. That is what, I mean, I felt so, and I was in, I almost went to NYU also. And the reason I didn't is because they wouldn't allow you to audition at the same time. And like I already, <clears throat> for the first two years, and I think about that now and I think, well, I should have just, that would have been fine. But so I went to the new school right around the corner mm -hmm. instead of Eugene Line, which I absolutely adored. But so I was, yeah, I mean, I was writing to Spike from my apartment and telling him I live in the West Village and it's not like it's super close to Brooklyn. And I just, you know, like, it just was. I ran into him in the elevator 
once when I was in college because he teaches the grad school at Tisch. Oh, right. Yes. And I could not get myself to say anything. <laughs> I was too starstruck. I was like, <gasps> like literally I did not even breathe. I just took a big gasp in and just held it. <laughs> oh, man. I feel like there are so many, I mean, Scorsese, like these are the the filmmakers that I, when I was really starting to understand that it mm-hmm. is a craft and like their movies are, like I would recommend you watch all of Scorsese's movies, all of Spike Lee's movies. I love Wonder Woman, for example, the first Wonder Woman mm-hmm. in terms of like, I'm going to show that. I think my daughter could see that now. I feel like I cried when I see that, when I saw that film that because I realized, scene. oh, they, I've never seen this before. I've never seen a movie where women do this. It was like very arresting to me and very emotional. I felt like this is incredible. That's one that- where you rent the theater for her friends when she's 13. Yeah. And bring yes. all the friends and their moms. That's right? Like... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, those would be, I'm thinking, oh, there are so many great movies. It's so hard to say. I remember feeling like Amelie was one of my favorite movies in the theater. Oh, man. Yeah. I did a semester in Paris. <laughs> and I ended up going to all of the spots in Montmartre of oh, Amelie and yeah. loving it and seeing some films in French. And I remember I felt like I had become fluent, even though I'm no longer fluent in French at all, because I would dream in French with English subtitles. Yes. <laughs> and like, because it was English subtitles, perhaps the French was not correct. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way, that's how I, well, I, that's what happened with me in Spain. And I lived with a girl from Fuente de Villa from the north of Spain in college. And so I went and spent a lot of time with her family over there. And the second time that I went, I started to dream in Spanish and thinking I went, oh, this is now how it is. Like I'm yeah. reading in Spanish and I'm obviously speaking it. And But that shift of when you start to dream in the other language, it's like, and she's the one that got me, her brother is a filmmaker, and they're the ones that got me hooked on Alma Dover's movies. And they were friends with his makeup artist, oh, and cool. she would come over to our apartment. And it was like, I that just opened up a whole other area of, of film to me that I loved. Yeah, well, this was such a wonderful conversation. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. It. I've loved it, loved it. This okay. is so great you're doing this. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you enjoyed the conversation, please don't forget to like and subscribe. New episodes release every Wednesday. And leave a comment and let me know which movie you think I should show my son. Until next time, take care.